Alvin Lee once said that he would walk out on stage and the crowd would be going crazy, screaming and shouting, and this bothered him. Why? Because he hadn't played a note yet. He said, I'd play a rotten show, everybody would come back afterward and say it was great. I'd play a good show and everybody would say it was great too. When the managers and agents all told him, Alvin, you can make millions of dollars, he said, what's the point of having millions if I'm crazy? Like most managers and agents, they all wanted the money, of course, and they didn't care about the feelings of the artist who created the music. How did Alvin Lee handle it? Well, let's take a look back on the life of the guy many called Captain Speedfingers, the fastest guitar in the West, and see what we can find out. Alvin Lee was born Graham Anthony Barnes, December 19, 1944, in Nottingham, England. He started playing guitar seriously around the age of 13. His musical background started with his parents. Alvin said, My dad, Sam, was an avid jazz and blues collector, and he and my mom, Doris, both played the guitar. So I was brought up listening to Lead Belly and Big Bill Brunzi, but as he got older, it was rock and roll that truly sparked his interest. Guitarists like Scotty Moore and Chuck Berry was the first to catch his young ears. Alvin would start out in his first band in 1957 playing rhythm guitar, but that wouldn't last for long, his skills constantly improving. In 1960, he would be playing in a band called the Adamites, who had a bass player named Leo Lyons and a singer, Ivan J. Later, they would be called Ivan J and the J-Men. The name would finally evolve to the J-Cats and finally settling on the J-Birds. In 1962, the Jaybirds would follow the Beatles into Hamburg to play the famed Star Club for a five-week stint. Alvin was 17 years old at the time, and like the Beatles, besides improving his musical skills, he also enjoyed the Hamburg nightlife. Just as the Beatles had returned from Hamburg to their hometown of Liverpool, a well-polished act, the Jaybirds came home to Nottingham a much improved act, especially Alvin Lee. The fans of the Jaybirds would notice a big change in Alvin and his stage performance. His charisma was starting to shine. Reason for this was, Alvin was the lead guitarist with Ivan J and the J-Cats. Front singer Ivan left, and that's when they became the Jaybirds. Alvin, Leo Lyons on bass, Pete Evans on drums, and a singer named Farron Christie. Now here's what Alvin had to say. By 1962, we were covering maybe 2,000 miles a week in the van, traveling around to play gigs. Then we were offered a five-week residency at the Star Club in Hamburg, Germany, via Ray Calvert, one of the looniest booking agents in the Midlands. But the biggest adjustment that had to be made to the band was when front singer Farron Christie decided he didn't want to go to Germany. So Alvin Lee took over as frontman and the lead singer of the Jaybirds. Alvin said, at the Star Club, we were sharing the stage with three or four other acts, including Tony Sheridan, and only had to do an hour a night. So we used to do versions of Bo Diddley and Joey D and the Starlighters, plus a rock and roll medley. That was my first time overseas. Everything I'd ever heard about sex, drugs, and rock and roll was compressed into five weeks. Gangsters, prostitutes, pushers. It was pretty scary for a 17-year-old lad from Nottingham. Yet, when you worked at the Star Club, you were given a special badge, which I've still got. And with that on your lapel, you could go in any Reaper Bond Club without any trouble. When we got back, we got rid of the rhythm guitarist. Then drummer Pete Evans quit, and we enlisted Rick Lee. Somewhere along the way, Alvin changed his name to Alvin Dean, but he said it only lasted for a week or so. Then he also stated, in those days, we wanted nothing more than to be noticed and consequently become rich and famous. Though when that happened, the reality didn't live up to the dream. After their return from Hamburg, the band spent the next year playing as many shows and club dates as possible, getting better all the time. In 1964, they decided to move south to London but this didn't work out, and after starving for a time, they moved back to Nottingham, where the money was much better. And in 1966, they once again headed back south to London, and this time, 
they would end up staying. It was after moving to London for the last time, the band was to change its name a couple of times before finally settling on 10 years after. The band name was decided on because 10 years after was referring to the fact that it was 10 years after Elvis Presley's big break in 1956, Elvis being one of Alvin's idols. It has also been told that it was 10 years after Alvin started playing guitar. There's even a few more stories that I won't go into here. Once getting to London, the band secured a residency at the legendary Marquee Club and an invitation to the famous Windsor Jazz and Blues Festival in 1967. These gigs were to lead to their first recording contract. The self-titled debut album surprisingly received airplay on San Francisco's underground radio stations and was embraced by the listeners, including a concert promoter named Bill Graham, who invited the band to tour America for the first time in the summer of 1968. Audiences were immediately taken with Alvin's soulful rapid-fire guitar playing and the band's innovative mix of blues, jazz, and rock, and an American love affair was to begin. Ten years after, would ultimately tour the United States 28 times in seven years, more than any other UK band. In 1969, Alvin and 10 years after played Woodstock in August. Now many consider this the turning point for the band. And in a way it was, but not until the Woodstock movie came out in March 1970 did 10 years after break big. Alvin said right around this time and just after the Woodstock festival, they were playing mostly the two to 3,000 seat underground clubs here in America. But after that movie came out was when they started playing the larger 20,000 seat venues. Then six months after they broke big, Alvin started hating it. Why? Alvin enjoyed playing those smaller clubs where the people came in to listen. The music came first. And once a band jumps up to the big venues, that part goes away. But bigger venues mean more people, more record sales, and of course, more money. You know this isn't an uncommon occurrence with musicians. It has happened to so many. Everyone from Humble Pie to the Beatles, they all felt like they were just puppets up there on the big stage. The Beatles just quit touring. Steve Marriott of Humble Pie went back to just playing the smaller clubs and said he was much happier doing it. Alvin was to do the same in due time. When asked about his guitar playing, Alvin had this to say. I basically play guitar from the hip, an instinctive reaction if you like, because I'm not one for practicing. I'm a jammer. My attitude was to go for it, and on a good night, I could get it. Back in the day, Alvin was considered one of the fastest guitar players out there, and in my opinion, he was. I guess the best way to sum up his playing can only be done by listening to him, and one of his better performances was on that Woodstock movie doing the song I'm Going Home. You get a good feel for his all-around talent. Not only could he play, he could sing. He had charisma. Alvin was a whole package. And of course, the band was tight. Leo Lyons on bass, Rick Lee on drums were great. And Chick Churchill rounding out the four-piece group on keys. There's quite a few good live videos on 10 Years After. And I'll leave a few in the description for any of you who want to check them out. His main guitar was called Big Red, so let's talk about it here for a bit. There's always been some good discussions on Alvin's Red Gibson ES-335. Many say it's a 1959. Alvin says, my famous 1958 Gibson 335 that I bought for 45 pounds in Nottingham was the best investment I ever made. It even had a fitted case. Although the guitar has been referred to as a 59 model, it's sort of impossible to know the year and make. The neck was replaced in the early 1970s after he broke the original at the Marquis in London after accidentally ramming it into the club's low ceiling. As a result, the serial number on the headstock had no bearing on the guitar's year of manufacture. An orange label inside the 335's upper F-hole bears the original serial identification but it was obscured when the body's interior was painted over in black, presumably to make the F-holes appear darker. Gibson's original factory-built number 
which would have been visible through the lower bout's F-hole, had been similarly covered up. Alvin has really modded the guitar and added a single coil pickup between the original PAFs. He calls himself a dabbler. I'm always changing pickups and rewiring. The Gibson has the original 58 humbuckers with covers removed and a fender pickup in the middle to give it a bit more top. It's good for the studio. The single coil pickup in between the two humbuckers has its own volume pot that I use as a blend control. I always like the Strat sound, but when I play the Strat, I find my little finger on the right hand keeps turning the volume knob down unintentionally. I figured that by adding a Strat back pickup to my 335, I'd have the best of both worlds. Alvin has also removed the Bigsby, which he replaced in 1970 with a TP6 tailpiece. The Bigsby probably had tuning issues that promoted this change. And of course, it's covered in stickers. They just got thrown on, actually, Alvin explained. But when I broke the neck at the marquee, I sent it back to Gibson for repair. And when it was returned, they had lacquered over all the stickers, so they couldn't come off. The original neck had a fretboard with the dot inlays. The replacement has block inlays. Its serial number indicates that it was manufactured sometime between 1970 and 72. Alvin has tried many different guitar styles during his career, but clearly favored Big Red, saying, the 335 is still my main guitar. I think it's the size of the body. It fits me quite well. I love to play strats, but I prefer to play them sitting down. I enjoy Les Pauls, but they feel too small and heavy. I'm just used to the 335. Alvin's family had Big Red put away in a vault, and I saw in 2019 that they were going to put it up for sale. At one time, Alvin had been offered a half a million pounds for it. I tried to track down the auction it was supposed to go up on, and there wasn't any information there. Last I saw was a video of Joe Bonamassa playing it, so I'm only speculating here, but I would guess he possibly owns it now. If anyone has any information on the whereabouts and the sale of this guitar, please leave it in the comments section. Alvin would finally get fed up with playing the big shows and would leave 10 years after. He missed playing the smaller venues where the people came in to sit and listen. He would go on to do solo albums and would even reunite with the band a few times also. Alvin Lee played with a fire like nobody else. He was lightning fast, and he could pull off some of the greatest riffs while he was singing. This all came from within. You can tell by listening to him play. For myself, I enjoyed his live music better than the studio cuts. Alvin was a great studio player, but his onstage performances were a sight to behold. He could blister your ears with the song, I'm Going Home, and in the same breath, take you to another plane with a song like Time and Space. He's another one of those guitarists who seem to only get the respect he deserves from other musicians. Jimmy Page said it all. Alvin Lee was the only guitarist I would pay to see. Alvin Lee died on March 6, 2013 in Spain. He died from complications following a routine surgical procedure to correct an arterial arrhythmia, which is basically an irregular heartbeat. He was 68 years old. Alvin Lee was known for being a private person and he kept his personal life out of the public eye as much as possible. Alvin Lee never won a Grammy or made it to the Hall of Fame. I do think he found what he was looking for once leaving the spotlight of 10 years after. He got back to playing smaller venues where the people could listen and enjoy his music. He got to work with many of the guitar greats on some albums and shows, and every last one of them had nothing but high praises for him as a player. If you got any good stories on Alvin Lee, or if you've seen him in concert, leave them in the comments section. And I hope you all enjoyed this video on Alvin Lee. If you did, I'll leave a few more videos right here I think you might enjoy. If you want, subscribe and give this video a like and a share. I gotta run. Appreciate all your support, and thanks for watching.